Hello, everyone. This is Ed Brenniger, and welcome to the Eddie Network podcast. And my guest today is Raul Deodar, who I met about 15 years ago through a, a group of uh, leaders online that were connected to Seth Godin. It was the tribes group. And those of you who were in that group remember great times that we had in communicating. And it was maybe for many of us the first time we had really experienced what relating to people across boundaries, across cultural, national, uh, historical boundaries really, really meant. So Raul, I'm glad you're here. Thank you for your willingness to come on. Uh, I'm very excited about the time we're gonna have together and I'm grateful for that. So tell us a little bit about who you are and what's uh, what your life is and where you live and all of that. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Ed, for inviting me. And it's a uh, it's a privilege to connect with you after, uh, you know, over the years uh, through writings and finally face to face. Yeah. Um, <laughs> to uh, to start, I will, uh, you know, I am a basically a lawyer and investor. So um, I started uh, as. As an MBA, I started my career in a company uh, selling uh, in an aluminum company. Then I moved to finance and I was, uh, you know, lucky or unlucky to be part of the global financial crisis in 2008. And uh, thereafter, I um, uh, started investing in something called as legally distressed uh, assets, uh, particularly land. And that's why I, I did my uh, post-graduation in law, and I do my legal work uh, at the Bombay High Court in Mumbai. So uh, that is on the law side. I do uh, half, probably more than half as a pro bono and uh, uh, sort of a social uh, work in terms of legal matters that I handle. Uh, the rest, about 40 to 50% are commercial matters where I earn the, the money and uh, some of them, uh, my own personal uh, investments are handled by our team in Mumbai. So I had the occasion to move to Singapore. So uh, because my wife is working here, so I move shuttle between Singapore and Mumbai. So that is uh, predominantly how I spend my time, you know, shuttling between uh, two places. Now, are they, I would assume that Singapore and Mumbai are very different places uh, to live in. Am I correct? Uh, they are. They are very two different uh, places, two very different places. Uh, you know, one is uh, very uh, orderly and regulated. Uh, you can almost predict it's a, it's a very well-organized society in Singapore. And it's very, very uh, closely monitored and tracked. So it's not uh, as free. But uh, if you go to Mumbai, it is uh, much more open and uh, chaotic, but uh, you, you have all your freedoms uh, in, in that sense. Uh, uh, you, you, you can probably say that um, Mumbai is about uh, 35 to 40 years behind Singapore. Singapore uh, really uh, took off after Lee Kuan Yew really implemented his reforms. And, and where would you put the West in relationship to Singapore? In that same uh, comparison, uh, in in uh, in terms of urban cities, because Singapore is more like a you know city country, you know uh, city state. Mm -hmm. So in terms of urbanism, I think Singapore is ahead. But in terms of uh, the the freedom uh, that that you have, it is uh, a little restricted. But you know, it's a, it's like a uh, it's a compromise. It's an Asian compromise that we call, but it is like, you know, uh, the relationship between person and state in Asia is more like a grandfather to, you know, so it's always that someone is monitoring you, it's fine because it's your grandfather. That kind of approach is there. Whereas uh, uh, the, the relationship between a person and state in, in, let's say, London or New York or any of the Western places, is much more uh, watched and carefully regulated because uh, when you say uh, you, you give away certain rights 
and create a state. So you you really want to not give away any more rights than the state needs. Right. So that's 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 the kind of difference. And I uh, this particular mindset is is uh, why Asians do not mind the state uh, looking at different things in their lives, whereas uh, in the West uh, we would uh, you know uh, be apprehensive if state starts uh, tracking some of the things that Singapore tracks out here. So yeah, that's that's a growing. Um... Uh, issue here the, the the surveillance state and um you know and it's and i think our perception i'm speaking just in my observations perception of people is it's not that i'm doing something that they should be watching me because i'm doing something that's wrong or 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 unhealthy or whatever it's that they're going to take whatever I do and find a way to turn it into something which is wrong. I think that's, it's it's been politicized and it's been weaponized. I think that's the terminology we we have yeah. here. against against the people. I think that's part of what we we experience here. And um, I mean, it's it depends on where you live too. You know, if you so it's uh, I live in a small town in in North Carolina, and none of that is is true. I'm sure that there's some kind of surveillance, but. You know, it's not, it doesn't really matter to me. It doesn't affect me. You know, if you lived in San Francisco, I think it would be m much different experience or so. Well, th that's interesting. Well, you know, as we talked a little bit before we went on the air, um, I'm interested in you talking with us who are in the West about India and telling us what we, we need to know uh, because, you know, all of our information is filtered, you know, and it's, and and I and I would say that it's filtered towards our benefit, you know, to place you all in a position of whatever it might be that where we are we made some kind of control, you know. And it's well, I mean, we live in a controlled state worldwide, so that's that's true. But I think the media provides a not a, a clear picture of of what who India is. What is India? And, and what does what is it that we need to know? Because um, it to, it appears to me. I mean, uh, sorry, I keep rambling here, but it appears to me that India is this place that has great significant opportunities for um, for change and for growth and for real benefit to the rest of the world. So, am I am am I correct in seeing that? Uh, I mean, yes, definitely. Uh, there is a lot of opportunity in India, but and but more importantly, I think you've put uh, the finger on the on the problem there that uh, many uh, the kind of impression that is created of India and not gen. I, I mean, I I wouldn't say that this was created deliberately or through um, you know. Uh, particular malicious intent or any other particular you know slant. Uh, of uh, intent, but uh, there is a difference between what the impression is and what the reality of, in India is, because uh, in most of the times, you know, when we say, uh, when we read a Western newspaper, we say, uh, you know, they, they come out, Modi is, is a right-wing government. This is Modi is a left-wing government. It is, yes, it is Hindu, uh, you know, the party aspires to be a Hindu party, but the policies are, you know, really, they will sit well with Democrats rather than uh, Republicans. I mean, of old. I mean, these days right. I can't make out what is Republican and what is Democrat. But, uh, uh, you know, it's more uh, left-leaning policies economically. And culturally if, or uh, socially, if you see, they're, they're still policies are uh, quite left, not right. So there are a lot of these things which we find very different that uh, you know uh, the West has impressions about. So I mean, if if I have to start, uh, you know, initially that uh, the idea of India or the concept of India, which is Bharat, actually what we call, is actually a, a lot lo older, and uh, people are trying to determine how old it is now. I tell you why it is that we don't know how old we are but uh, like for example when we have our epics in the epics in 
some of the chapters you find that you know they have given detailed descriptions that the moon was in this place the sun was in this place the jupiter was in this place and all the uh, planetary positioning is given now they have managed to use this new planetary software and run it backwards and they found that uh, you know this time where everything of whatever is mentioned matches is about 7000 uh, bc so uh, then there are others who say ki no it should be you know 8000 it should be 10000 and then there is a debate and the reason for that is because uh, around 800 uh, of the common era that is 800 ad uh, what happened was india started getting a lot of islamic invasions and uh, most of our libraries and books and uh you know they were destroyed universities were destroyed so there is a um, uh, anecdote that is being told that uh, one of the universities in india it burned for like 3 months and all the manuscripts and all the details you know all whatever records were there they they were burnt and destroyed so there is a lot of missing knowledge and as we uh, the resistance against the islamic invasion was getting stronger we had the colonization from europe uh, the british portuguese and dutch uh, were the three uh, who managed to uh, you know find a foothold the french appeared uh, later a little bit but uh, and that uh, really went off in 1947 now at 1947 when we when india became free it became free by separating a part of the country uh, separately giving it for uh, the muslims so india was divided into two regions uh, one for the islamic state of pakistan uh, which had two parts one is the east pakistan which is today bangladesh and west pakistan and the the india that was left was uh, we think because you know in, if you consider the hindu religion hindu religion is not a religion it is uh, is a dharmic way of life it so the faith systems actually fit into you know one of the there are many faith systems in hinduism so uh, the buddhist sikhs christians everything can be fitted the jewish were there uh, so we didn't have any problems or rashians are there so we have no problem with accommodating one more faith system so the india that was left that what is india today is a secular country now secular means uh, india doesn't need to be secular because india by definition it is secular so because every faith within what is called hindu there are also different kinds of uh, faith systems within that some who believe in god some who don't believe in god some are atheists some say ki there is only one reality some say there are multiple realities all are faith systems within the fold so that the, gave us a political structure which was secular in nature but the indian state that was created was predominantly anti hindu so now this is a unique thing indian this, this state is control, 1947 this is 1947 yes this is this is indian government this British. is indian government this is not british this is indian aha uh-huh. and the state uh, which also inherited some laws from britain but uh, the state which came to power which is indians now this is nothing to do with the colony uh, colonial uh, right. thing anything so it controls lot of temples in india but it doesn't control the churches or the mosques or any other religion it only controls the temples and the controls because you know any donation goes to the temple it is goes to the government it doesn't come to the temple so all these kinds of things exist in india which make the indian state and you know indians are also fighting against that you know why are you interfering in one religion either you interfere in all or you don't interfere so it's a choice that indians are asking the government to make yeah it it's, it seems i, I don't under, i don't understand how the sort of the uh, foundation religion or culture of of the country is um is is sort of suppressed while the others that are 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 sort of alien that are coming in from the outside 
maybe they're not encouraged, but they're not. They're not uh, given the same restrictions. That's a very interesting thing. Did not know that. Yes. So, uh, you know, so that is one part of it. But uh, this is on the social side. Yeah. And on the economic side, uh, what happened was uh, we, uh, you know, like we have different schools of thought within India and the Gandhian school of thought is very famous and it believes in, uh, you know, completely uh, non-violence to the, uh, you know, to an extreme. Now, when you, in a personal space, non-violence is a very, uh, you know, uh, it's a goal worth pursuing, definitely, and it has its own uh, thing. But as a nation, non-violence cannot be a, a goal. And one of the uh, problems with the initial governments were that they said, Ki, you know, why do we need an army? We don't need an army. I mean, we are a non-violent state. And now these kinds of stupidities happened, and I don't know, I mean... Uh, it's probably an early um, experimentation with being a nation. There were some hurdles, some explanation, whatever the problems were. But uh, so when uh, India became independent, uh, US was the first to you know welcome us into the League of uh, Free Nations, uh, the oldest democracy, largest democracy, that kind of uh, mm -hmm. concept. And India decided that, no, no, we don't want to be part of any, we will be in a sort of ascetic mindset uh, as a nation. Now, uh, the realities of uh, geopolitics is that you cannot be non-aligned. Now, for whatever reasons, then the US, you know, it couldn't, uh, you know, we, we, we sort of spurned US. So then the, the Russians, they also tried and Soviets, I mean, not the Russians. And they were a little more uh, smarter about, you know, sort of wooing our leaders. And the influence of Russia grew. And uh, then there were some sort of conflicts with Pakistan, uh, where US was supporting Pakistan, because geopolitically, this area is very crucial. Because if you see uh, the location of India, India can control about 80% of world's oil flow. Because right. we can access Suez Canal, the uh, Iranian uh, Gulf of Aden. We can also block the, the Malacca Strait in Singapore. So this unique position mean, meant that this is a very volatile region. So there has to be some sort of a, uh, you know, uh, presence in this region. And it will be perpetually uh, chaotic, won't it? I mean, it, it's no way around it because of the geography. No, it will be okay. But uh, because uh, one thing about India is that India doesn't want to invade anything. So India is not interested in you know expanding its borders or anything. But uh, India has, uh, I mean, if India is controlling, in, it will be, you know, okay. It will be along the world's normal uh, rule of law kind of thing. But uh, when India was not there, it was really not there. And then this socialism really gripped us. And uh, we had really anemic growth. And uh, uh, for a country that has been sort of uh, pre-colonial times, it was one of the wealthiest countries as per what uh, experts are calculating. But uh, in 1947, it was one of the poorest. So we needed to grow very fast. And uh, at that time, uh, we, did, we slept at the wheel. That is the uh, reality of it. But uh, starting from 91, for whatever reasons, we started you know, opening up in our own way with you know, two steps forward, one step backward, or something like that, you can call. Uh, but uh, we started moving towards uh, development. And uh, naturally, it followed a lot of corruption, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, scandals and scams of, uh, you know, financial and non-financial, both kinds. And then actually, uh, when Modi came to power, it was that he, I will 
be i will clear all this corruption and he had managed to clear his, the corruption in his home state he was a chief minister for some time and he had done all this improvement so when modi came the first time india is experiencing a corruption free relatively meaning like the top level corruption is almost gone uh, and and how, bottom, how did they do that how did they uh, cl cleared out the corruption so the thing is he uh, he manages and micromanages everything ah. i mean the bureaucracy he micromanages the bureaucracy and uh, you know the cabinet and all the ministers they they are on you know like absolute on their toes you know the meeting starts somewhere in 6 o'clock in the morning and go right till 11 o'clock in the night and if that guy is working so much then you know he's uh, he's not a he's not a young man and then all these young men have to work and then you know it 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 actually you know i mean one of the things i think you had written in circle of impact or probably in our tribe discussion that uh, if the leader the people follow the culture of the leader and that that sort of you know uh, permeates into the organization uh, and that's what happened sort of because he was intent on getting reforms intent on getting infrastructure he said ki you know we have laws which are passed by the british in you know 1875 or something why do we need those? those those realities are gone so one law i will repeal every day that's what he said at least one law and he did whatever you know some of these nobody reads i mean they they, they exist on the books for i don't know what reason and uh, some good some bad he made some mistakes he made some progress but overall he has been corruption free and he has been focused on growth and that is absolutely at the right time because most of the indian population now is at a young uh, phase we have a very young population our average age is like uh, i think 28 or 29 something like that mm -hmm. which is one of the youngest population and the largest now so all these young people with all this energy if they did not have avenues and they did not have opportunity or they do not see the prosperity or growth happening then it would have been a social problem and with the uh, i'd like to ask you about these young yeah. people because i'm 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 interested that in them worldwide you know in africa they they tell me that 70% of the population is under 30 you know so you yeah. probably have a similar um yeah uh, ratio there and which tells me that young people are the future obviously that's always been true but but it's even at a greater level, particularly in the West, where we have declining birth rates, and and um, it's and so I, I see the so what are the opportunities these do these young people see that they have there in India? What and how does how does a, how do those opportunities get developed and provided to them? If, uh, if that makes sense, that is that is yeah that is the, that is where the whole challenge is and as you know even now when you look at uh, uh, the population we have had basics which need to be fixed so we didn't have roads in most of the places we didn't have access to uh, power reliable power uh, internet and now suddenly you know with all the development uh, you have 4G connections, not 5G yet, but 4G connections across almost every part of India, you will have a 4G connection. Mm -hmm. You have a digital uh, app, which we use uh, for UPI, it is called. It's a payment system, which is nice. one of the, uh, it's one of the largest payment systems in the world. And it's zero cost because the government just, you know, it puts up the infrastructure free. And that has enabled all these people to sort of plug into the digital economy. Now they they started, you know, the uh, you know, lot of these uh, unskilled people. They started going into the gig economy the, as delivery, uh, you know, uh, for goods. Now in India, if you go, if you order groceries, you can. There are various levels, so. You, there are some apps which will tell you that within 30 minutes your 
whatever you order will be at your doorstep now all those things they require people and they have been uh, you know uh, employing a lot of these people uh, serving a sort of an middle class which is uh, the middle class is focused on education they have got good education they have got decent uh, post graduation graduation and they are into uh, technology banking or manufacturing all sorts of uh, industries uh, we do have exposure in and uh, this class is being served by all the the poorer class who are not skilled and what we need is now the manufacturing part we have a lot of manufacturing in india india uh, produces a lot of uh, two wheelers and small cars for the world but uh, we need lot more manufacturing in terms of uh, newer technologies newer things how does how do you all look at um education from this standpoint do do you see that um there's a high level there's a high need for for technical education like skills skills for working in manufacturing and that sort of thing or is it like we have here where it's far more um what's the word i want to use uh esoteric you know it's all about ideas and about you know it's 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 less about those basic skills for uh performing jobs uh it used to be but it's no it's no longer so is what what's happening there in terms of education so uh, unfortunately here also the esoteric parts have uh, started because they need far lesser investments and they are more easy to do mm-hmm. uh, and you know uh, easy to replicate across uh, you know we have a billion people so easy to replicate is a good model but unfortunately we we do need a lot in basic skills like manufacturing where you actually start from as uh, uh, you know machine operators as cnc uh, basic programming for these modern machines which are actually fully computerized so you need to know computerized uh, you know the cnc language and you you need to deal with those kinds of uh, things as well and there is a lot of uh, uh, development on uh, what you call soft skills like for example if you you will find much more development on uh, let's say something like nursing staff so indian nursing staff is probably very high quality and uh, so uh, indian hospitality the way we do we do crib about it uh, these days but is really good i mean uh, it's so that, we, we we do pardon so, me so that feeds into the opportunities that come with with um tourism and travel throughout the yes, country yes. And, and and it's it sounds like you're you're creating a culture of work that didn't exist before uh the service aspect did exist but it was not professionalized so now they are yeah. you know the it is more attitudinal fit is already there it's not like a, a new thing but uh something like you know uh, manufacturing you know these new technologies particularly you know when you go to switch gear and uh, some of these uh, instrumentation uh, side of things there you need lot of more lot more technology so uh, exposure to that like for example i'll tell you uh, why that that is so because we didn't have money so for example um, in our college there were only five computers i am talking about a school rather you know as we call it junior college but you can say only five computers for the entire school i'm talking about 90s but uh, you know i'm sure in uh, the person who got more time on the computer would be a lot easier to you know a skill in terms of information technology that changed only in uh, probably 95 96 that time where us had actually moved it was like 20 years ahead of us 
Now, if you look at microelectronics, that still hasn't become as big a you know a thing in all these small small colleges as I would like to see. So, so it sounds like you're going through the same development process that any 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 nation any culture will go through uh, as it identifies how how to grow its economy. And um, so, what do what do you see? Where do you see India, if, say, fifty years from now? What do you have a sense of what India will be like in the world then? Uh, see, I mean, in in uh, fifty years from now, we 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 better get this right. That is one. Uh, you know, I would start with that. First, we have to get this right. But uh, having said that, and I think most of the things that the current government and the current uh, sort of um, group of ideators are creating that they are fairly on right track. So that is okay. But we need to act fast. And if we are able to pull it off, I think we will be uh, a middle income country where China is today, but with much more vibrant, uh, you know, free society than yeah. uh, you can imagine otherwise. And the reason is the Indian uh, youth, if you see, they are very interested in sort of, you know, uh, the enterprise of their own. And they don't have much guidance in that space. So when, uh, you know, like, there is a enterprise which is, you can create around art or, very specific uh, manual skills. But the modern enterprise is not like that. Modern enterprise is more like a plug into a supply chain of a you know, wide variety of things that are available. And you, know, you create your own product from those raw materials and move on. And that is the place where I think Indians are uh, struggling at the moment. And uh, they are looking at what US is doing, let for example, some Apple is assembling all the things, they're designing something, and then they are saying, you know, yeah, I think this is how it should be the phone look like. And they're pulling out parts from everywhere in the world. Maybe we should also do that. And maybe we should do something. And there the uh, the soft skill gap that we are talking about is is substantial. So people need more guidance on those kinds of creating that enterprise in that kind of a way what you know how to create the uh, old ones like uh, you know make a tractor that people can do that that we know how to do that what is what is your sense of the future of uh, globalization as we have seen it over the last 50 years you have a sense of that um it is uh one of my favorite topics, uh, you know, because uh, when globalization started, actually it is uh, also because of these technologies that you can see me, I can see you, and mm -hmm. we can see what is going on in the US and what facilities are available. And then, you know, we suddenly say, why don't we have that? And that's how, you know, ideas are being exchanged. Mm -hmm. But uh, previous to that, we just had to exchange people. So you physically had to go to US and then, you know, experience whatever. And then, you know, so it was only a movement of labor. Then we had movement of capital. Now we have movement of ideas. And once ideas are, you know, like in tribes, we had one of the most interesting experience from, you know, globally sharing ideas. And right. uh, once you have that, I don't think you're going back. Now you're going to create hurdles, definitely. And we will do that because, you know, most yeah. of it is driven by emotions. So emotional fights will always create problems, but then we'll resolve it. One of the things that I have been observing is you know, the, the difference between organizations that are highly centralized and those that have learned how to decentralize and and they there's dispersing power and they're dispersing their their money and and they're asking people to take a far greater initiative to 
to do things even in under the uh, the shell of a of a company or a corporation um to me it seems like the, the world is has reached this peak of centralization where that works and it is now moving towards a greater decentralized world because the people are skilled the people are knowledgeable they have they have phones we get to do what we're doing right now i mean we could be uh, creating a deal we could be solving a problem we we can do things that do not require a lot of intermediation and um how how is that um how is that understood in india and i'm thinking in particular of how that ends up serving people who live in local communities and how they how they can say oh we have this problem here i'm going to go look the world around and see if i can find some new ideas and bring those ideas here and we can solve our problems here like they are doing in Denmark or in South Korea or wherever they may be. No, actually, you know, uh, however much we criticize WhatsApp groups, I don't know if that's a phenomenon in US, but here it's like WhatsApp, everyone adds you into some group and, you know, spams the hell out of you with some videos or some uh, articles or some, you know, memes or maybe something. But they are in effect sharing some of these ideas across the world and uh, which they find interesting. And uh, what has happened is that because in India, what we have created is like a, an identified, you know, we have a, something called Aadhaar, which is a unique identifier for a person, which is like a social security number in the US. Mm -hmm. And that allows people to sort of get all the benefits to themselves. So they don't need to be in one place. So I am, let's say, in the North India. And now for a job, I am moved to South India. Then all my benefits will still get into my account. And I'm wherever I am, it doesn't matter. Government still adjusts for me. You can where move to where the opportunity is. Yes. And that has become... Uh, but there is another side to it. Now, when I move, let's say, from a North Indian place uh, to a South Indian city and there is let's say a, something to be done in my North Indian uh, town or a village and it's on WhatsApp you know this is what we want to do nobody understands what to do and you know a whole sort of uh, network of web sends in information and ideas to that place and now they can also send money so it's not just ideas it's so a lot of institutions or infrastructure like basic things you know like we need some shed to be built for bus stand or something like that which is just a local people getting together trying to do something and it gets done because just people send as low as ten dollars fifteen dollars and then because there are five thousand of them they're sending and it gets done so the connectivity yeah. is much more and idea exchange has become like quite, you know, useful in that sense. So uh, that has actually, um, you know, made a life a lot more easier. So now people are more mobile. There is a lot of exchange and uh, it develops in, so we are always, you know, like, when an Indian meets another Indian, he'll always ask them, what is your native place? Because that is always an anchor. So, you know, and that's where everything goes eventually. So that, that helps. So technology asked, is helping. We ask the same thing, but we're asking what country you're from. Because everyone's <laughs> yes. an immigrant. <laughs> and yeah, so it's, it's similar. It's very similar. You know, the, the thing that I have discovered um, in building networks around the world is, um, is that the things that, that we share, the things that are similar are far greater than the things that, that are different. And, and that, that to me, that to me says that for when, when we're able to spend much more time building our networks where I'm taking the initiative and you're taking the initiative and, and we're encouraging other people to take the initiative to build these relationships out. It means that there's greater power that comes to them, greater facility for doing things, and the opportunity to make a better world for the people in their community 
is much greater because of it. And I think that's that's what I see as the future that's coming. You know, and I think about 1.4 billion people in India and and all of those gaining that sense of of uh, agency to be able to take initiative and make a difference for my for my people, for my community, for my state, um, for my family. I think is um, to me is the is the kind of the final. Uh, stage of the advance of technology for us, um, you know, as long as we recognize that and we allow ourselves to take that initiative and to um, to build those networks with people like like we have here. Yeah, indeed. So, in in uh, you know, if you if you see the the way India uh, the way these ideas work is, I wanted to uh, share one example. There is a program, I don't know, it's, uh, it's called The Best Singer or something. I don't know, they, they, they have yeah. these X and, you know, I... I, I there are different uh, versions of that, yeah, but yes. Yeah, so they have some like dance items and they have singing uh, items. And uh, when people in India saw those, they said, Ki, you know, we can do that. And we can do something really interesting because, you know, uh, so those ideas like in other study which has uh, i found uh, they had mentioned that these uh, uh, wave surfers are there the uh, you know uh, so when they discover a, a, a kind of a, a whatever you want to call it i don't know the surfing terms but they they show record some uh, guy doing a really trick uh, you know, uh, thing with the surfboard and the wave and all that. And within 24 hours or 48 hours, you can see surfers from Japan doing or trying, attempting the same move, trying to get the same, uh, you know, uh, kind of thing with their, so the ideas move very fast and resources are the, uh, where everything gets uh, thing, you know, the, that's the bottleneck. And uh, this government, for whatever it is doing, it is trying to create that de-bottlenecking across, uh, you know, money, goods, travel, everything. So that's where we find hope. So, uh, so in conclusion, we should be looking to India as um, a source of leadership and a source of inspiration for how we in the West should be um, functioning at the, at the state level. It sounds like. I think at a, certain, at a certain point. Yeah, it will be a little different, and uh, it will definitely add to the discourse. Definitely. Yeah. Well, I think we have we have lots of things to improve, and and um, you know our politics makes things very difficult to for the sort of things that you know where you, you're decentralizing things and you're giving people a greater a sense of a, a possibility for contribution to their community, that sort of thing. And it's it's really, um, it's part of the conflict that we end up having here. Well, Raul, I'm really grateful that you uh, have joined us today. And if, if uh, somebody wanted to reach out to you and have a conversation with you, how would they find you? Uh, so they can uh, reach out on my website. It's uh, rahuldevdhar.com. Or uh, they can uh, go to my uh, Twitter handle, which is probably where I'm most active. It is uh, Rahul Devdhar, R-A-H-U-L-D-E-O-D-H-A-R. So well, we'll you... put all that in. We'll put all that in the show notes so that <laughs> people can find you. And and I hope I'd like to do this again. Uh, you know, in some time and um, and learn. And I think. Uh, see see how things continue to develop and i appreciate uh, you coming on thank you very much thank you very much and and thank you for watching and uh please sign up and 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 like but even more so offer your comments and your questions and um that way we can have a conversation that just is not two-way but also three or four or ten way and that way we learn from one another, we gain insight, and we also build relationships with one another as we, we comment. So thank you, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you.